Good morning. Good morning. Let me welcome you to the Streetsboro Church of Christ. For those that are in attendance and for those that are online. To our visitors, visitors, you are truly our honored guests. We enjoy the fact that you've taken time out of your day to worship with us this morning. And to that, the Churches of Christ salutes you. In worshiping with us this morning, to those visitors, you will find us to be a spirit-filled church that believe in the oneness of the scripture. You'll experience five points of worship, from prayer to an opportunity to give of your means to communion, communing with us, as well as being admonition and hearing a portion of God's word. And at the conclusion of our service, the message, a sav the Savior's invitation will be extended to you. And from that, if you have any questions about things that you've heard or things that you've seen, why we do what we do, we're as close to you as the telephone, and we invite, we invite your participation so that we can get to know you better and help you to understand that there is truth in serving a living God. By way of announcements this morning, while we have our continued those that are on our continued uh, list, we do have some new and updated since last week. Catherine Miller had carpal tunnel surgery this past week. Liz Brookover, Mom V, is in poor health. They have hospice care coming in. The Treadways, Friends of the Prices, are dealing with COVID. And um, our former members here, Kevin and Kathy Lighticker, both have COVID. You know, COVID seems to be running rampant. As you know, my brother Michael, who was baptized here, he too is um, down with COVID this morning. And COVID has gone through our family pretty rapidly. Not only Michael, but my sister and my niece and nephew too have experienced it. Um, Ann Erson's sister-in-law, Chandra, she has COVID. And her mom, Anita, also has COVID and devil pneumonia. So we want to remember them in our prayers. Tara Varga is out of the hospital and she's back at the nursing home. So let's continue to pray for her as well. And um, David gave me the name of Jim Varley who once held a meeting here for us uh, some years ago. He passed away. So let's remember his family in our prayers. And you may not see Bruce and Pam this morning because Bruce is having a procedure on Tuesday and he's tested for COVID. Not that he's been diagnosed with it, but he's tested so far, so he thought that it'll be better that he stay home this morning. So we're going to um, open up our worship, and we're going to lift the Lord up in prayer. We're going to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and we're going to hear a message from Ralph. It's good to see Ralph. This, I came in the door, and I'm like, wait a minute, this Thanksgiving. Actually, when I saw the bulletin, I said, wow, I can't remember the last time I worshiped with the prices the day after Thanksgiving or the week before Thanksgiving. So it is good to see um, him and his family. And I'm so interested in this topic this morning. It's a deadly bouquet. So I'm like, I want to hear more about that. So I hope that you can uh, join us and uh, let's really open up our minds and our hearts and let's uh, divest ourselves of all the cares of the world and let's enjoy ourselves together this morning, even in these pandemic and COVID times. Let's begin our worship service. Good morning. morning. Our first song this morning is 694. 694. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way. 694. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way. Oh, Rose is blooming there for me. 
Step by step. 970. 970. Oh God, you are my. Let's pray. Anyway, Father, we're thankful for this day, for the beautiful weather we have to enjoy. We're thankful for the great blessings you bestow upon us day in and day out. We know that there are others that, and some of us who are having difficulties and challenges. We know that there are people who are suffering uh, with their health or have had procedures or have faced loss. And we realize these things and help us to always be mindful of each other's uh, situations and to be attentive to one another to the best of our ability. We know that we have great spiritual blessings and we have the hope of eternal life in your son and pray that you'll help us to always keep that in the forefront of our lives and that we will not lose sight of that. That we will not be 
overcome by the burdens of this life, but to look for the hope of eternal life. I want to thank you for the successful surgery for Sean and pray that you'll be with him and strengthen him. Pray that uh, that surgery will be a success. Uh, there's others who are facing surgeries and procedures. We pray that you will be with them as well. We're also mindful of the Farley family and the loss of Jim. We pray that you will be with them and pray that you will strengthen them as they uh, continue to go on without him, as they look forward to reunion with him uh, when this life here is over. We're so thankful for the country that we live in. We know that there is a lot of turmoil that's going on. We realize there's a lot of civil unrest. There's a lot of uncertainty. We pray that you will be with our leaders. We pray that you will be with our citizens, that they'll realize the great uh, benefits that we have being a part of this nation, the great freedoms that we have, the rights that we have, uh, the opportunities we have to make it a better country. We pray that you will help our nation and our leaders to realize uh, the greatness that you are and your word and uh, the great security and prosperity that's available uh, to this land if we will but uh, turn and be faithful to you. We pray that you'll be with us as we continue to worship you. We pray that you'll be with each one who is present with us, uh, whether they be here physically or electronically. Uh, you pray that you will be with your saints and be with others as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. 784. 784. This is the song we will sing to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. 784. Mm. Why did my Savior come to
This morning as we gather around this table to remember our Savior Jesus, I want to share some passages and a few thoughts with you this morning. I want to begin with Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. It reads, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. As we think about the beginning of that passage and think about the fact to love one another and to put the interest of others first, and if we think about that in our Savior Jesus, his goal when coming to this earth was nothing more than to put others first. He came to this earth with love for one another, as we just sang in that song, and to ultimately suffer and to die on that cross, not for himself, but for each one of us. Continuing on in the passage, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So why did Christ die on the cross? As I mentioned, it wasn't for himself, but for you and me. I want to read Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So as we gather around this table to remember Christ, it's a time of remembrance of Christ's death in the past, an awareness of his presence in our lives now, and and of course an anticipation of his coming again. So as we partake of this bread and of this cup, let each one of us reflect on his death and what it means to us in our lives. And remember that Jesus died for you and me personally. Jesus shed his blood for you and me personally. You've been forgi- we've been forgiven personally, and we've been made a child of God personally, all because Christ put himself above others, and he died for each one of us, and he put, put our lives ahead of his and was willing to die on the cross for us and, and put us first, and it showed that great love for each one of us by suffering and dying for us. So as we uh, partake of this bread, let us offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Father in heaven, we come before you in prayer. We thank you so much for Christ our Savior. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for your plan of salvation for mankind and for Christ's willingness to carry out that plan by coming to this earth, living a perfect life, Heavenly Father, and going to that cross and suffering and dying for us. 
having his body broken and his blood shed. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we partake of this bread, that we might remember that sacrifice, and remember what he means to us in our lives, and uh, put him first and strive to live lives that are pleasing to you, that when Christ returned, that we might be able to spend eternity in heaven with you. We ask now that you bless this bread and each one who partakes of it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now offer a prayer for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we approach thy throne again in prayer, thanking you now for this cup, this fruit of the vine that represents our Savior's shed blood, that precious blood that washes away our sins and makes us as white as snow. We're so thankful again, Lord, for his death on the cross that can help us to be in a right relationship with you and that can give us that hope of heaven with you someday. We ask now that you Bless this cup and each one who partakes of it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper, and at this time we take opportunity to reflect on how we've been blessed. We take opportunity to be able to give back to God as we've prospered, and as we think about as we go through this life, and even with all that is going on in the world today, that we still have roofs over our heads and food to eat, and so many things to be thankful for, as hopefully we've reflected some on this past week our families and our loved ones and even though a time of maybe not being able to get together right now but um, we still have that love and support around us and most of all we have God to take care of us and provide for us and know that um, he knows what's best for each one of us in our lives and and he'll continue to provide for us those things that we need as he has promised to do so in his word and uh, even if we just have the basics in this life that's all we need to get through it and God will God will take care of us and so um, we all, again as we mention every week we have three opportunities or ways that you can give if you're here we have the box in the back on the wall uh, you can certainly reach out to us if you would like to bring that contribution by here at the building uh, someone will meet you for that and uh, we also still have the PO box available here in Streetsboro that you can mail that to but as we take this opportunity to reflect a little bit on how we're, God provides for us, let us go to him in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you once again thanking you, Lord, for this day, for the breath of life, for our night's rest in our homes, in our, our, our warm homes, and the comfortable beds, and for all that you provide for us, Heavenly Father. We're thankful for this building that we have to meet in, to gather together, and we're able to be here and for the technology we have that we can worship with our brothers and sisters who are unable to be with us at this time. And we just are so blessed, Heavenly Father, if we would just sit down and, and think about what you do for us and provide for us each and every day. Pray that as we think about these things, Heavenly Father, and as we've prepared to come to worship you today and to give back to you that we've prepared in our hearts and we take this opportunity to give back to you and we pray that we do so cheerfully and we pray heavenly father that you would bless this offering and pray that it is used in a manner pleasing to you to be able to support the work here and to spread your word throughout the world in whatever ways we can we ask now that you bless this offering and each one who gives in jesus name we pray amen
Our next song this morning will be song 761, number 761, Where He Leads I Will Follow, 761. Sweet are the promises God is the Lord, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Your was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. Gave the great example is a pattern for me. song of invitation that song will be song number 67 67 bring christ your broken life but before our scripture reading again the song of encouragement will be 67 if you're following along in your hymn books before our scripture reading though we'll just sing song 971 number 971 restore my soul 971 Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, renew my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive. Today's scripture reading will be Ezekiel 18, 19, and 20. That's Ezekiel 18, 19.
Good morning. As I ever alluded to, usually we're gone either this weekend before Thanksgiving or the weekend after Thanksgiving. Uh, we're glad to be able to be here today. Our in-laws wanted nothing to do with us this year, so we stayed home. My, my mother-in-law is probably watching. We're sorry, Debbie, just kidding. <laughs> we're going to think today about a topic that really affects all of us, whether we realize it or not, because so many of our religious neighbors um, believe these doctrines which we're going to discuss. The title of our sermon today is A Deadly Bouquet, Digging Into Tulip. As you're going to see, the word tulip is an acronym that stands for five different doctrines that are part of what we call Calvinism. John Calvin was a French theologian that lived in the 1500s during the Restoration. And uh, his teachings have really led to this, this doctrine of Calvinism, as we call it, and these five points of this doctrine that are all really based upon the first point of this doctrine, which is the idea that man is born into the world in a state of sin. So one of the core beliefs, really, of most denominations, whether people realize it or not, and I've noticed many times that people who are members of some denominations don't even realize that this is a tenet of their faith, but most denominations believe that man is born in a depraved state, in a state of sin. And this is often called total hereditary depravity. That's the T for total in tulip, or sometimes it's referred to as original sin as well. Now, you think about that term, total hereditary depravity, each word, let's define. Total, it means complete. Hereditary, it means that which was or has descended from an ancestor. Depravity, if you look that up, it says it's a Vitiated state of the heart, wickedness, corruption of moral principles, destitution of holiness, or good principles. Now, I don't even know if I pronounced that vitiated word right. I had to look it up. I didn't know what that word meant. But it means to injure the substance or qualities of a thing, to impair or spoil its use and value. So total hereditary depravity, then, it's the idea that the soul of man is completely and totally depraved, completely and totally evil, and that's hereditary. In other words, when you come into this world as a newborn baby, you have inherited that depravity from Adam and Eve. This doctrine teaches that man is born in a state of total corruption and wickedness, and that this corruption then has been passed through our ancestors all the way back to Adam and Eve. You look through some of the um, confessions of faith of some of the denominations that are out there. I just have two examples really today. But the Calvinistic Methodist Confession of Faith, if you look down there, and I know this may be small, but I'll read it to you. Uh, and point D says, As he, talking about Adam, was the root and representative of mankind, his first sin is imputed to them, and his corruption flows into all his seed who sprang from him by natural generation. In consequence of this natural corruption, mankind are becoming capable of goodness, yea, opposed to all goodness and prone to all evil. And from this depraved nature springs all actual sin. Now understand, this is talking about total hereditary depravity. You are, when you come into this world, completely evil, there is no good in you whatsoever. The Westminster Confession of Faith, point number three there, talking about Adam and Eve, it says, They being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed. Imputed means to lay it to somebody else's account. And the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity descending from them by ordinary generation. So again, the idea is that Adam and, in, Adam and Eve have sinned, and the guilt of that sin then has passed down to all of their ancestors, of which is, of course, every single human being. If you look in, the, in Catholic doctrine and Catholic teaching, you'll find that uh, original sin is usually what they call it. They don't call it Calvinism, but it, it refers to the sin that Adam committed. That's why it's called the original sin. 
but in that as a consequence of that first sin, the hereditary stain with which we are born on account of our origin or descent from Adam. Again, so whether we're talking about denominationalism or even Catholicism, this doctrine of hereditary depravity is prevalent in all. And again, I've talked with many people who are members of, uh, we talked about the Methodist Confession of Faith and, and Baptist and, Ca and Catholic, who when you mention this, well, I've never heard that. It's never been taught. They don't even realize, though, that it is a tenant of the church to which they belong. Now, from this doctrine of total hereditary depravity, that's where we get our tea. But there are four other doctrines that really come about as a result of this first one. This first one is the groundwork, is the foundation for all of these others. Because if hereditary depravity is true, then that must mean that unconditional election is true as well. Limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. These are all doctrines, really, that spring from the belief that man is born with the sin of Adam, the guilt of Adam's sin. And what we're going to see is that this doctrine is far from the truth. Actually, it, it's poison. It's deadly. And uh, if we believe it, it can cause us to be lost. And we're going to look at that. It, it, it says some terrible things about God himself to believe this doctrine that is set forth for us. So, first of all, again, let's dig in a little bit deeper to the doctrine of total hereditary depravity. And I have on your screen there... Psalm 51 and verse 5. This is one of the key passages that people who hold to this view go to to try to argue that man does inherit sin. In this passage, David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. But again, we have to ask ourselves, what is David really saying there? Is David saying that he was born in sin, or was he saying that he was conceived in sin and born into a sinful world. It doesn't teach that he was born sinful. It simply states he was born into a world where sin was prevalent. And we'll, we'll, we'll think about this a little bit more as we go along. Another passage that often confuses people is Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Actually, it's more than just verse 12, but verse 12 is a, is a key verse. Here it says, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now, it's argued from this verse and, and that really that whole context of that passage there that this teaches that the, the guilt of Adam's sin, the consequences of Adam's sin have all passed down to his ancestry. Well, what is it that this passage tells us was passed down? Not the guilt of Adam's sin, but rather it says death spread to all men. Not sin. We don't inherit Adam's sin, but what we do inherit, one of the things that we inherit are some of the consequences of that sin. And we know that physical death came into the world as a result of Adam and Eve's sin against God. So the only real consequence of Adam's sin for us is that you know, death has come into the world. But as the verse points out, we've all sinned, though, so we've earned it for ourselves. We have no right to complain that, uh, you know, it's unjust because all have sinned. So the guilt of Adam's sin isn't what's passed on, but rather physical death as a consequence is passed on to all men. We need to be very careful about the translation we use of the Bible. Um, the NIV translators, I've done sermons on this before, but if you look in the preface of the NIV, you'll find that it says that the translators have striven to give a more than word-for-word -word translation of the Bible. And so really it's not a translation at all. It's more like a commentary, really, because they're acknowledging that they have put their own thoughts and own bias into the text. It's not word-for-word. -word. Well, their bias has crept in in various places, and Psalm 51.5 is a good example here. In the NIV, it says, Surely I was sinful at birth, and sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, is that what the verse said? We looked at it. It said nothing of the sort. But again, this has crept in because they have allowed their theology to come into their translation of the Bible. The same applies to, to the Romans. Uh, in chapter 5 and verse 12, 
It says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Whereas the NIV says, those who live according to the sinful nature. Now again, the word is flesh. In the Greek, the word is flesh. Sinful nature is not the word. And they have set their minds on what that nature desires. Again, the idea that we're born sinful, we're born depraved, that's why we... We desire things that we shouldn't have because we have a sinful nature, okay? So be very careful about the translation that you use. And the NIV is not a translation, really. Uh, it's, it's more of a commentary if you want to be truthful about it. Some of the passages we can look to to see that this is not true, this hereditary depravity, is well, number one, the one that was just read for us by Travis, Ezekiel chapter 18. Uh, verses 19 and 20. Here it, it's very clear that verse 20 tells us the soul who sins shall die, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. Now, sin is a breaking of God's law. First uh, John 3 and verse 4, sin is transgression. Um, so sin is breaking of the law. Newborn babies that have, have just come into the world and even very young human beings uh, up to a certain age of accountability, they, they don't understand right from wrong and they're not then held accountable by God for that because they, uh, they, they haven't inherited anything. This passage says very clearly, the son doesn't bear the guilt of the father nor the father the guilt of the son, just like the son doesn't bear the righteousness of his father or the father the righteousness of the son. We're all accountable for our own actions. So Ezekiel 18 verses 19 and 20 makes it very clear that I don't inherit the sin of my father. And if you go back far enough, you could say Adam is my father. Uh, if you go back enough generations, I don't inherit that guilt. I'm guilty enough by my own actions, my own sins. I don't inherit somebody else's sin. Another argument is, is that we remember that God gives us our soul. For example, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7 says, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. God gave us our spirits. They are, they are from God. Also, Zechariah 12 and verse uh, 1, the, the last part of the verse there, Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. So God gives us our spirit. Now what are we saying about God if we're saying that God gave man a depraved spirit. Again, it's removing all responsibility for my sin from myself. It's putting it on God and saying it's God's fault. He gave me this depraved spirit. And he then would be guilty of evil. Especially in then turning around and condemning us for that. That guilt that we have inherited. But yet we know that the Bible says that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. He doesn't give us a rotten soul. He hasn't given us a spirit that is depraved and only capable of thinking and doing evil. James 1 and verse 17, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. God is definitely a good tree, okay? And anything he would give us would be good. It would, he would never give us a depraved spirit that, where we inherit the guilt of somebody else's sin. So that is the doctrine of total hereditary depravity. Now we're going to move on to the you, which is unconditional election. And again, as I said, the rest of these points all build off of that first one. The idea that man is born sinful, depraved, has inherited the guilt of Adam. Unconditional election, again, the, it teaches that man is wholly inclined to do evil and unable to do good. This doctrine came to life as a result of the doctrine of original sin. Therefore, unconditional election says that salvation then is based solely on God's choice. Because we're all born evil unable to do good, una unable to think good. Therefore, they argue that God has unconditionally, so there's no conditions, he has chosen certain individuals who are going to be the elect. They're going to be the saved. 
And that choosing has nothing to do with my character, my actions, the way that I behave. It's all arbitrary and it's all God choosing who's going to be saved, who's going to be lost. The Bible talks about predestination. That's another term for this unconditional election. Predestination, choosing your destiny beforehand, the idea that God has chosen, you're going to be saved, you're not. If, uh, Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Okay, so again we have in there in verse 4 that he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and then we have in verse 5 he predestined, pre-chose us, to be sons by Jesus Christ to himself. So this is one of the key passages that proponents of this doctrine try to make say what they want it to say, but it's not really teaching that at all. And we'll talk about what it's teaching. They also emphasize grace over works, okay? And, you know, we realize that grace is important. Romans 3 and verse 24, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so again, unconditional election says God chooses you. It's, if you're one of the elect, it's by the grace of God that you've been chosen. It's not on any basis of your goodness because you're wholly evil. Okay, and, and you think also of Ephesians 2, uh, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so again, they argue that, that grace is what saves us, not works, not obedience. That has nothing to do with our salvation, is what they would say. Well, the answer to this is this. God has chosen who's going to be saved. And he made that choice before the foundation of the world. But he's decided that his church is going to be saved. Again, you look back to that passage in Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. He's chosen us in him. Who's us? Well, Paul's writing to the church. Okay, he has predestined us. Who's us? It's the church. And so God decided before he created mankind that in the church, through Christ, he was going to save those who were in the church. Okay, but, but he leaves the choice of whether or not we want to be in that church up to us. So it is not unconditional election. God has chosen. There are a certain class of people who are going to be saved. Those who are in the kingdom of Christ, those who are in the church that belongs to Christ are going to be saved. But he allows each of us to make the decision of whether or not we want to be in that church. So it's not unconditional election. And we are saved by grace, that is true, but notice Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says we're saved by grace through faith. Okay, so grace is God's part, but faith is my part. And we know that, of course, the scriptures teach that faith without works is dead. James chapter 2 and verse 20. Do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? I take the word faith there, and I, I kind of, when I think of it, I think of obedience. Okay, Faith is good, but faith is demonstrated by obedience, by your works, by how that faith affects you and makes you act and behave. So faith without works is dead. So again, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it doesn't mean that no obedience is required, that no works are required from us. It means that um, God has saved us by his grace, but we, are, we access that grace by faith. And faith implies obedience as well. The Bible does set forth very clearly that man has a choice in whom he's going to serve, and where he's going to spend eternity. You go all the way back to the time of Joshua, this passage we all know very well, Joshua 24 and verse 15, where David tells, David, Joshua tells the children of Israel, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. God gives us that freedom to choose. You know, the Bible tells us that we are made in God's image. Okay, and 
one aspect of being made in God's image is free will, the freedom to choose. And He has given us that gift. Also, we remember on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, Peter's sermon there, it says, with many other words, he testified, exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Okay, So he, he's exhorting them to obey the gospel that they may be saved. Again, if the doctrine of unconditional election were true, we wouldn't have to preach and convert people because the choice has already been made by God. And if they're saved, they're saved. If they're lost, they're lost. You have no ability to change that whatsoever. It is unconditional. So that is unconditional election. Now, think also of this. In Romans 16 and verse 7, Paul makes the statement, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. Now notice this last phrase, who were also in Christ before me. Now we could read over that and not realize the importance of it, but it really emphasizes the fact that unconditional election or predestination as it is taught in Calvinism is not true. Because there were some people who were in Christ before Paul was in Christ. Now, if unconditional election is true, predestination is true in the way that it's being taught, then that would mean that you're either in Christ from the beginning of time or you're not in Christ. It's, it's all been decided beforehand. But Paul said that these individuals were in Christ before him. Well, that's because they made the decision to obey Christ and access the grace of God before Paul did. It makes perfect sense if you don't follow this doctrine of unconditional election. Also, Ezekiel 18, uh, verses 21 and through 23 now. If a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done. He shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God? And not that he should turn from his ways and live. Notice there at the very last phrase, not that he should turn from his ways and live. What he's doing there is he's encouraging the wicked to turn from his wickedness and live. If unconditional election were true, why would he do that? Their actions have no bearing, no effect on their eternal destination. So again, if man were born wicked without the ability to do good, and God had not chosen him for salvation, how could he turn and live? It would not, God would be telling him to do something that he was incapable of doing. So again, it makes God unjust um, if we believe that to be true. Also, the passages in the scriptures that talk about the judgment, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. If unconditional election is true, our works don't matter. Because God's made the decision already. So why would he talk about being judged according to our works? Why would Jesus say in John 12 and verse 48, um, you're going to be judged by the words that I have spoken? It would just doesn't make sense at all. Now we move on to the third doctrine, L, limited atonement. This doctrine teaches that Christ's atonement at Calvary wasn't for all mankind, it was for the elect. You see how these doctrines sort of build upon each other. Uh, hereditary depravity means, well, we're all wholly evil, so God has to make the choice who's going to be saved. Well, if God makes the choice of who's going to be saved, then that means Jesus didn't really <laughs> die for everyone. He only died for the elect. So his atonement is limited to the elect. So since man has nothing to do with salvation and God chooses who will be saved and who will be lost, Christ's atonement must not have been for all, so we have limited atonement rather than universal atonement for sins, okay? So limited atonement. The Bible teaches, though, that Christ died for the ungodly, not just for the elect, but you look at Romans 5 and verse 6, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Again, if limited atonement were true, we'd have to cross out ungodly and put in elect there, wouldn't we? Christ died for the elect, but that's not what it says. It says Christ died for the ungodly. 
the verse, verses uh, we know well, John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world, well, he loved the elect, right? For God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten son. Now this next phrase, we just have to take that out because that can't be true. Whoever believes in him should not perish. Belief has nothing to do with it. It's all God's choice, right? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Well, not the world, the elect through him would be saved. You see how this doctrine, it makes the Bible make no sense whatsoever. You have to rewrite it in order to make this verse teach this. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men, well, not all men, the elect. He desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, he desires every... If it was all God's choice, he'd just let everybody be saved. But, but there, God has more qualities than just his love for us. He's also just and righteous, and, he, and he's not going to allow sin to go unremitted, un, unforgiven. Second Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, well, you better make that the elect, not willing that, well, that the elect should perish, but that the elect should come to repentance. Again, we see that limited atonement makes no sense. The scriptures are very clear that Jesus' atoning death on the cross was meant for all mankind. That sacrifice is there for every one of us. And we again benefit from that sacrifice when we have faith and obey the will of God. Irresistible grace then is the next, next doctrine in this. If God chooses the save, then man has no say in it. His choice is irresistible. That's irresistible grace. Thus, one of the elect is going to be saved whether he wants to be saved or not. We could even go to the extreme of saying this guy could be a devil worshiper and worship Satan and glorify Satan. But if God has chosen him as one of the elect, he's going to be saved. It's irresistible. You can't say no to God. That's irresistible grace. And really, this is easy to answer. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this point. We just simply need to remember that God gives us the ability to choose whether we want to be saved or not. We already looked at Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Acts chapter 2 and verse 40 again. Be saved from this perverse generation. The King James says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So it's the idea of, yeah, we have a choice to make. We do preach and we do offer the invitation. Why? Because people can resist the grace of God. They can say no and we want them to say yes. God wants them to say yes. If it was irresistible, there wouldn't be anything we could do about it one way or the other. We think about Judas. Judas was able to resist the grace of God. You can't deny that at one point he was saved. He was one of the twelve in Luke chapter 9 and verse 6 in regard to the twelve. It says, they departed, went through the towns, preaching the gospel, healing everywhere. Judas was included in that group in Luke 9 and verse 6. But we know that he fell, didn't he? In Acts chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, when they were trying to choose Judas's replacement before the day of Pentecost there, Peter makes the statement about Judas that by transgression he fell. He fell. So he was able to resist the grace of God. You can't deny that at one point he was saved. And, and here's what they often do. When somebody who is one of the elect um, becomes unfaithful and they leave the church, what do they say? Well, they were never really saved. They were never really one of the elect. But you can't deny that Judas was one of the elect. He went out and did miracles. He healed people, preached the gospel. He was one of the elect. But then he fell. So falling is indeed very possible. And that leads to the last point, perseverance of the saints. This is the belief that if you're one of the elect, if you're one of the saved, that you can never become lost. You can never lose that salvation no matter what you do, no matter how you behave. One, one passage that sometimes is used to, to set this forth is Jesus' statement in John chapter 10, 
verses 26 to 28, he says, You do not believe because you're not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So Jesus says in verse 28, I give them eternal life, they'll never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my Father's hands. This is one of the passages that people go to to try to argue. Once saved, always saved. Nobody can snatch you out of the Father's hand. And we, I hope we understand that Jesus' statement here, keep in mind, he says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. As long as I hear Jesus and continue to follow him, he's saying nobody can take my salvation from me and I'll never perish. That's what Jesus is saying. Keep it in context. Continue to follow him. Continue to hear his voice and nobody's ever going to take your salvation from you. That's something no one can do. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that if you're saved, you can do whatever you want and behave however you want and you'll never lose that salvation. That's not true. So the Bible teaches that the saved can, once again, become lost. Just a few passages, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame if they fall away. So Paul, I believe it's Paul here, in Hebrews chapter 6, we don't know for sure who wrote Hebrews, but the Hebrew writer is telling us if somebody has been enlightened, they've been partakers of the heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Spirit, saved, if they fall away. They can fall. We can fall away. Second Peter 2 Verses 20 and 21, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the elect, you're saved, you've escaped the pollutions of the world, but they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than, than the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Peter says you can go back. You can escape the pollutions of the world and be saved, but then you can become entangled back in those pollutions of the world, and the end result is you're worse off now than you were before you ever obeyed. And a, can a Christian fall away? Absolutely. Peter says so. The Hebrew writer says so. Paul, in 1 Timothy 1, he makes the statement in verses 19 and 20, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Some have suffered shipwreck concerning the faith, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. He mentions two people by name who had fallen away, whose faith had become shipwreck because they believed things that were not true. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 9.27, we have the statement from an apostle, Paul, where he says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul said that even he wasn't beyond the possibility of becoming disqualified. So it took constant effort, diligent effort on his part to remain faithful to the Lord. So perseverance of the saints, once saved, always saved. It's not taught in the scriptures. Rather, continued diligence, continued Effort is required on our part to continue to walk in the light and live as God would have us to live. As we conclude then, we have the five tenets of Calvinism summarized by Tulip, total hereditary depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Again, though, as we said, they're all really built upon that first one, total hereditary depravity. That makes all of the others necessary. But if you take away the T, the total hereditary depravity, you just have ULIP, and that doesn't mean anything, okay? So if you take away the total hereditary depravity, the other ones fall apart as well, okay? They are not biblical. They are not taught in Scripture. Rather, Scriptures make it clear. We're born into this world, not in a saved state, but in a safe state, because we're innocent, and we're not guilty of sin, because we don't even know God's law to break it. 
And so we're born into this world in a state of safety and a right relationship with God. At some point when we grow up, we choose to do wrong. We have sinned then against God and separated ourselves from God. We have the ability then to choose to serve God, to obey his will, that our sins might be washed away. You have the ability to choose. If you're here this morning and you've never made that decision to obey the gospel of Christ, we offer you an invitation right now. Based upon your belief in Jesus, please act upon that faith. Repent of your sins as he commanded. Confess your faith as he commanded. Be baptized as he commanded that your sins might be washed away. If you've not done that, we're going to sing a song and you could come forward this morning and we could baptize you into Christ that your sins might be washed away. You can become one of the elect by making the choice today. If you're already a member of the Lord's church, but you're no longer living as a Christian ought to live, or maybe you just need the prayers of the church for some other reason, we'd be glad to help. And again, you can come forward as well, and we'll help you in whatever way that we can. Please come as we stand and sing. Mm Christ, your broken mind, so marred by sin, he will create a new, made all again. Your empty, wasted years, he will restore, and your Closing song for our closing prayer. Let's sing 680 from 680. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. 680. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you at this time to thank you for this day of worship, for the opportunity to learn more of your word, to learn more of the truth that you've provided for us. We are very blessed to have the Bible, the only source of what you desire and what is the best for us. We ask at this time to to bless those who are sick and for the families who are involved, we ask that you help them and heal them and, and support us to help them in time of need. Dear Lord, we are very thankful to have the, the narrow path to salvation we are very thankful for your son, Jesus, who gave us that path on the cross. We are very thankful that you gave us the choice to be saved. And it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> 